Thank you, and good morning, and welcome to worship as the First United Church of Christ Congregational here in Milford, Connecticut, where we welcome all God's children, and we are proud to be God's people. I'm Reverend Adam Eckhart, senior pastor, and we have a number of things going on in the life of the church. For example, just a few minutes ago, our high school youth group, Senior PF, they uh, set out on their mission trip for this week down to Eastern Maryland. They're going to Earlville, Maryland to uh, work with Deep Roots Incorporated, which is a ministry site that, uh, that serves with uh, people who have been homeless or are homeless, uh, especially families with children. So they'll be doing um, some work on uh, some building areas and then also working with children and families there, working in gardens, all sorts of different things. But uh, we sent them off. They were commissioned at the 8 o'clock service, and now they're uh, somewhere on I-95 right now. They may have not gotten far by now, for all, for all we know. Even on a Sunday morning in Connecticut, who knows? But we are grateful for uh, their service and their ministry. number of things going on in the life of the church, uh, women's fellowship, is a group from this church. They meet on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. down in our fellowship hall, and that's for women of all ages. And then uh, recently, we have started up a play group on Friday mornings, 9 to 11 a.m. in the church nursery for little ones up to four years old, and that's uh, free, facilitated by our Minister of Faith Formation, Kelsey DiCarlo. Uh, Kelsey, is there anything I should mention about summer Sunday school? or Classroom A, Classroom a for summer Sunday school uh, so there's going to be good activities there and then afterwards there's vacation bible school as well in classroom a as well i think there's going to be some dirt involved um, not dirt, not dirt. But paint. paint okay so you can potentially get messy which i know is a plus for people of a certain age um yes we're excited we're wrapping up pride month here at first church with uh, pride sunday with themes especially during my sermon and uh, speaking of which after worship there's a sermon discussion group that takes place in one of the uh, uh, round tables in fellowship hall so you're welcome to come there after worship this is the last sunday of june which means next sunday is the first sunday of july when we share in the sacrament of holy communion we also invite you then on the first sunday of the month to bring in food items for our food pantry which has become busier over the last couple of years uh, and so any help that you can give towards that is greatly appreciated. There are, is a list of items uh, in our bulletin insert. Uh, the trustees of the church are moving forward with an engineering firm, GNCB, uh, moving forward and gathering bids to work on the exterior of the steeple. 20 years ago, we had worked on, on the interior and the exterior. The interior is still good. The bones of the steeple are good, but we need to work on the exterior because of that New England air so good uh, with the salt water on uh, that wood. So we're having uh, some bids. Uh, we're going to be collecting bids in the next uh, months so that we can move forward on, uh, on renovating the outside of the steeple. Um, and uh, we are also moving forward with celebrating the bicentennial of this space. This, this space was, uh, they started building it in the, uh, the middle of 1823, and they, uh, they then... Uh, they had a big celebration in the spring of 1824, so we're going to be remembering that. And then our other space here in the building was built uh, for the centennial of this one, so it was built in 1923, so we're going to be celebrating the centennial of the space that's now our fellowship hall and kitchen and offices. Um, as I mentioned, Senior PF is on their way down to Maryland, and so we will continue to pray for them. And uh, we give thanks for our liturgists this morning, uh, Linda, and our musicians, Cameron and William. But now let us turn towards one another and greet each other with signs of Christ's peace. Peace be with you. Peace be with you out there online, people. And now will all who are able please stand for our responsive call to worship. When we are baptized into Christ and the church, we are clothed in Christ's love. That Christ's current judgments based on gender or identity. 
In Christ, a person with financial wealth is not valued more than one who is poor. In Christ, there is no discrimination based on ethnic background. In Christ, we seek to honor the lowly and provide a space where human dignity flourishes for all. Let us worship our one God who is proud to love all God's people. Please remain standing and join me in the prayer of invocation found in your bulletin. Holy and beloved one, we gather first just to say thank you. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for being our master teacher, leading us through the journey of your life, death, and resurrection. We thank you for being the one who cares so much about us that not even a hair can fall from our heads without you taking notice. We thank you for challenging us to claim our identity as your disciples, even when doing so puts us at risk for the sake of compassion, justice, and extravagant welcome to all. We thank you for this community the First United Church of Christ Congregational in Milford. Make your presence felt among us. Help us to see you in the faces of all who are gathered. On this Pride Sunday, 
help us to celebrate the beautiful array of all we are as we worship you in spirit and in truthfulness. We pray this with faith in the grace and truth of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. Unless... Is that better? <laughs> if you are a kid or a youth and are interested in coming down for our children's message, please join me down the front. I, I appreciate you too. Thank you. Can I ask you to scooch in over here a little bit? Thank you for scooching in. Um, Part of today, I want to share a book with you. Um, so today we are celebrating being a church that welcomes everyone. So our church made a promise, also known as a covenant, um, to welcome everyone in our church. No matter who you are, no matter where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. No matter what your family looks like, what you look like, how much money you have, or where you come from. Everybody's welcome, right? Um, so this book was actually given to the classroom library by the parrots. Um, and it is um, one all about that. So I wanted to share it with you today. We're gonna read it first and then um, I'm gonna ask you some questions. Sound good? Cool. Let's see how I can do this with the microphone in my hand. A church for all. Sunday waking. Day is breaking. Let's go to our church for all. Church bells ringing, joyful noises. Choir singing, laughing voices. Candles glowing, banners flowing. Come enter our church for all. Weary and healthy, neat and messy. Poor and wealthy, plain and dressy. All embracing spirit gracing each one at our church for all bodies wiggling mommy's reading children giggling daddy's pleading toddlers flailing Babies wailing. There's room at our church for all. Hands receiving, hands connecting. Hearts believing, hearts accepting. Feel the spirit. Can you hear it? It's here at our church for all.
And then this is the author's note that's all about the church that inspired the story. Um, okay, so first question. Was this book a thumbs up or a thumbs down for you? Yeah, thumbs up? Cool. Thumbs up, cool. I gotta ask the adults too, right? Um, what was your favorite page in this book? Did anybody have a favorite page? I'll show you my favorite page. Where is it? This one. This is my favorite page. If you want to take a look at it. Um, when you look at this page, what do you notice happening? What do, you, what do you see happening in the picture? I know, it's, it's hard. I'm, I'm balancing the microphone and the book. Yeah. Parents accepting their children. Amazing. Children, what? Crying. Where, where do you see kids crying in here? Parent picking up the child. Can you, can you point where? Oh yeah, the one, the one in green. What else do you notice? I see kids laughing, like in this bottom corner. It looks like they're joking and like having fun. Yeah. People talking to each other. There's a grown up pointing out a page in a book over here. Um, can you tell who's a family in here? One more time. So people sitting in the same pew, maybe? But that's also like a maybe, right? Like, you can't really tell, like, where the line is ends and begins of who is a family. And, and I think that's pretty cool because it sort of shows that the entire church is a family, right? Any other things that you notice? Oh wait, maybe, maybe that'll work. Hey, <laughs> bounce it on my feet. <laughs> um, how do you think people on this page feel? Accepted? Does anybody look sad? Maybe. I was trying to find somebody who looked sad. I feel like there's a lot of smiles. It looks like one of the dads in this family is the daddy's pleading. He's got a finger up to his mouth like, shh. Yeah? Does anybody have another page that they wanted to point out? No? I've got one more that I want to show. Where's the choir? Here we go. Here's the choir. Okay. What's the same about everybody? They're all wearing the same thing. They're all wearing choir robes. And they're all people, right? But beyond that, everybody is unique and different, right? I used to have pink hair, and I think I would fit in in this choir, right? You've got somebody with blue hair, green hair, people with no hair, everybody. Um, why do you think that the author wrote this book? No thoughts? What about you all? Anybody have a thought? Why do you think the author wrote this book? Sharon. To emphasize that everyone is welcome. Amazing. 
Any other reasons you can think of that the author might have written this book? There aren't a lot of faith-based kids' books out there that emphasize this. And that's sad. Because everybody should be welcome, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to bring this downstairs with us, so if during Sunday school you want to take a look at it more closely, you absolutely can. Um, and I'll bring it into Fellowship Hall as well at the end of church, so if anybody wants to take a look at it, because I know it's really hard to see the pictures from the pews, especially when I'm struggling to hold it up even sitting here. <laughs> so if you would all join me in the spirit of prayer. Dear God, help us remember that every person is unique and an expression of your light and love. Please guide us to celebrate the awesomeness of everyone around us and be welcoming to all. Amen. Okay, let's go to classroom A. The church's open and affirmed covenant honors the full humanity of all people. We not only welcome people who are of all orientations and identities, who are new to our congregation, but just as importantly, we maintain our unconditional love for young adults who have grown up in this church as they discover who they are. It is our sacred calling to embody the love of Christ in the life of our youth and young adults. Thank you for upholding God's unconditional love in this place and help us to reach more young adults by supporting our youth ministry and our open and affirming presence in the area. Will the ushers please come forward as our offerings are given and received.
Please remain standing for the prayer of dedication. God, we learn from you and this church the value of life and love and following your ways. We dedicate ourselves to continue growing in faith. We dedicate these offerings to feed our growth through worship and Sunday school and the growth of your kingdom through outreach ministries and evangelism. Bless us as we follow you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please remain standing for him in New Century Hymnal 292. You may be seated. Well, and that, that hymn was talking about to do one will. I was reminded, though, that there are two wills who were helping out with uh, music this morning, so I want to thank not only Cam, but Will and Will. So thank you, the two wills. Uh, this morning's scripture reading comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 40 through 42. So in the last uh, couple of weeks, we've heard Jesus give some direction to uh, his disciples uh, as he's realized that uh, his compassion for the crowds cannot be met by reaching out to all of them. So he sends out his 12 inner disciples uh, to heal and to preach and to bring the message of the coming kingdom of God. Uh, and so we, we read a little bit about that, especially last week. We're skipping over some elements uh, here of the ways in which Jesus knows that the disciples will not always be welcomed. Um, and the ways in which his message may uh, split families apart. But then he ends his discussion about, uh, about their ministry out in the world by talking about welcome. So listen now for God's word. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. May God add rich blessings to this reading of Holy Word. And will you pray with me? God, your word is a cup of refreshing water to us. It sustains us. It brings us hope. It wakes us up to the reality of your love. May we continue to experience your living water. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, uh, first of all, I just wanted to point out that this, uh, this reading connects very well to the mission that our youth group is going out on starting right now. They may, as of right now, maybe they're on the cusp of making it in New York State. I'm hopeful. Traffic's good. Um, 
but, uh, but they're going down to, like you said, the Deep Roots Incorporated, this organization that helps serve uh, the needs of folks who have been homeless. And so you hear these words about reaching out, offering a cup of cold water uh, to someone or welcoming somebody in a prophet's name. I believe that our youth group will be involved in that mutual welcome, being welcomed by the, uh, by the folks there of the organization uh, Deep Roots experiencing that welcome, uh, that sacred welcome that God is offering through them. And then also the youth, in return, will offer a welcome. They'll be working with some of the children there. Uh, they'll be helping out with some renovation projects. And so they're also going to be welcoming folks into this sense of God's love and sharing that message. So I think it's a mutual kind of relationship. So I certainly appreciate what they are doing and will continue to pray for them throughout the week. But today is also a Pride Sunday here at the church, and so I wanted to speak a little bit about, uh, about what that means for this church and for me. So leading up to this congregation's vote on our Open and Affirming Covenant in 2019, as the senior pastor, I was, not, I was asked to not take on a strong advocacy role one way or the, another about that because we didn't want to potentially pressure anybody to feel like they had to vote in a certain way or make people feel uncomfortable coming to me about how they were feeling through the process. And yet it was very clear when I was called as senior pastor that the congregation was exploring whether to make a more public witness to its in affirming embrace of all God's children. And I frankly would not have signed up for this call if I had had major misgivings uh, with the process or with an open and affirming covenant. So I thought it might help for you all to hear a little bit of my story of where I came to, or how I came to the place here as being a pastor of a church that is now uh, open and affirming, uh, and as someone who might be described as an LGBTQIA ally or accomplice. So I think of the influences on my life coming from three major spheres um, about, uh, as I look at the lenses of sexuality, gender identity, and the like, I think of the cultural influences, my personal and familial influences and my church influences, okay? So first of all, I think culture is what we all swim in, and so when I think about the first messages I heard about gender and, uh, and sexuality and identity, I remember television being very um, important in that, right? So I remember being a kid and watching Three's Company and wondering why John Ritter's character of Jack Tripper was acting a little bit different whenever the landlord came by. Because I, as a little kid, didn't realize that the premise of the whole show was based on the fact that John Ritter's character was living in an apartment with two single women, and the only way that the landlord would allow the single man to be living with single women is if John Ritter pretended to be gay. I didn't know that at all. It totally went over my head. I just thought he acted different. I also remember other things I watched on television, like I remember watching MASH, and I, wa I remember watching Corporal Klinger dressing up uh, like a nurse. I remember watching um, Some Like It Hot on television. They, wa they showed that movie. I remember uh, both Tony Curtis, and I remember Jack Lemmon dressing up like women so they could hide their identity from the mob who was chasing them because they were witnesses to a massacre. Um, I remember watching Bosom Buddies in the early 80s with uh, Peter Scolari and uh, Tom Hanks dressing up like women so that they could live in an apartment complex with women. They were very convincing as women. No, they were not at all, right? Um, but it was interesting because at, at that point, um, all of these situations, especially with cross-dressing, had to do with desperate situations. Like, oh, the only situation where somebody would do that is if uh, they were um, desperate um, or if they had some kind of pathology uh, back then. I also then remember in the early 90s watching uh, the TV show In Living Color because Jim Carrey uh, was on that show and people told me that I looked like Jim Carrey. So I, I watched that show, but then there were also other uh, parts like there were skits with David Allen Greer and Damon Wayans uh, where they were acting, they were portraying fictional gay cultural critics Blaine Edwards and Antoine Merriweather uh, and they uh, they mimicked being gay and effeminate with lisps and all of this stuff, and I remember being able to mimic that because I've had a lisp since I was a small child. I remember, you know, beyond that, I continued to be influenced by uh, culture. Um, 
But at that point, then, I also remember being influenced by my family and especially by my parents. I didn't realize it at the time how significant my parents' influence was on me. Now, as a parent of four children, I realize how influential we are on them, even if they don't admit it. Even if our influence is that they want to do the exact opposite of whatever we do, we're still so influential um, as parents and as family. And I remember uh, my parents speaking well of folks of different backgrounds and identities and orientations. But more than that, I actually remember the fact that they, the, the many things that they didn't say. Okay, so they uh, really, in, in many ways, it was is what they didn't say that was formative to me. They didn't blame categories of people for their problems. They didn't try to treat people differently. We lived outside Chicago in a suburban area. Then we lived in Central Florida, which was very diverse. Then we lived in Corpus Christi, Texas, which is Latino majority. Then we lived up in rural Wisconsin, which is very, very white and German. And in all those places, they didn't use slurs or speak poorly about people of any background, including people who were gay. I think it had to do with my parents having been advocates in the civil rights movements as they were growing up in the 60s and 70s. I think my dad, as a UCC minister, appreciated the power of words, and so he did not use disparaging words towards folks. Also, I can't, I can't overstate the significance that I think it was to grow up in a united church of Christ. Uh, at least uh, in my younger years, the UCC churches expected children to be raised to develop an individual and faithful conscience. And you could listen to the preacher or your Christian ed minister. You could listen to them talk about the Bible and about faith. But young people needed to decide how to interpret Scripture and how to use their logic and their experience and their sense of history so that they could be responsible theologians as they grew up and give their two cents to the direction of the church. That's the way that the Congregational and UCC operates we don't have somebody from on high telling us what to do. We all bring the Spirit of God together. So we have to develop that. We have to be willing to question. We have to be willing to think about our faith. And uh, I, you know, it's just one thing about the UCC, that everybody has their freedom of conscience. But over the course of the UCC's history, um, it's been the case that many of the four, people on the forefront of the abolition movement in the 19th century and the civil rights movement in the mid-20th century and in gay rights movements more recently, there have been many UCC people who have been at the forefront of that because of the way in which their conscience has been developed. And there are many people who have looked not only at the seven verses that to some seem to commit condemn homosexuality, but more importantly, look at the sweeping narrative of the Bible and the ministry of Jesus and have decided that for them, discrimination toward people who aren't hetero or cisgender is not compatible to them with faith or with following Jesus. I also remember that my uh, church in Florida for 7th and 8th grade, we didn't have regular Sunday school. We had sex ed for class for 7th and 8th grade. I was the only boy in that class for two years. That was interesting. Um, <laughs> but it was really eye-opening. Our teacher, Cindy, explained human sexuality, not in judgmental terms. If anything, she was talking about the blessing of the human body. She talked about the emotional investment that is required for healthy sexual relationships. She linked a lot to the love commandment, to love our neighbors, all of our neighbors, with charity and kindness. And I remember through those sessions laying a groundwork for me to wonder what was the big deal about sexuality and differences about that. I remember going to high school, and high school was very formative as well, culturally. I remember all the things that happened, at least in the early 1990s, whispers of rumors of female PE teachers, were they closeted lesbians. I remember having a favorite teacher about whom rumors were spreading that they were bisexual. But I think my faith and my family had given me a path that I chose to follow to not use those rumors as an excuse to think any differently of my teachers other than as the fine teachers that they were. Then my exposure to different sexual orientations and identities really exploded when I went to college. I had a couple of classmates who lived in rooms near me who discovered that they were gay while they were at college. And I guess I could have been judgy at that point. Um, and I certainly wasn't happy with my one 
gay sweet mate who lost one of my bike locks. I was really upset with that um, when I think back about it. But uh, I was mostly just sad that in coming out, my classmates basically were entering into an underground gay subculture because even in the mid-90s, in an urban area in New England, um, the culture uh, for folks who were gay or bisexual or lesbian tended to be underground because there wasn't a place of welcome um, in the mainstream of uh, that community. Uh, I remember going to my college chapel. There was a gay couple who most Sundays sat several pews in front of me and to the right of me, and while I didn't interact with them much then, they offered me the example of how love makes a family and how love is love. When a girlfriend of mine broke up with me, it was one of my chaplains who happened to be a lesbian who gave me priceless pastoral care, listening to me, assuring me that I would make it through this crisis. I then went on to divinity school to study to be a minister, and there many students who were LGBT struggled how to reconcile their faith and their faith traditions with their own personal experiences. Listening to them taught me about the universal desire to be accepted by God for who they are to be accepted by God others. I took classes with Letty Russell, who was a feminist theologian and lesbian who emphasized the centrality of hospitality to the Christian message. She loved the words like the words in today's reading. At the end of each semester, she would host a party for everybody, and she would offer extravagant hospitality, she and her partner, Shannon. It was in one of my uh, theology and ethics classes with her and Margaret Farley that I wrote a paper on the story of Sodom in Genesis 19, not as a story condemning homosexuality, but condemning the radical inhospitality that people were suggesting they would uh, give to the, the angels. And so I felt that the irony of that story is that when people in, in, interpret it as judging homosexuality, I believe that that perpetuates the real sin of Sodom, which is being inhospitable to strangers and people who are different from us. I remember being really excited to then use that story in the debate that I took part in uh, when I ran for student body president my second year at Divinity School. Somebody from the, co the, the gay coalition at the Div School asked what we felt um, about uh, the place of LGBTQ folks in the community. And I used that paper and other things that I experienced um, to, to say that the school should be as hospitable as possible to people of different sexual backgrounds and identities. So then I became student body president, and then there was a first-year student who became very active, and we started to interact, and then I really got to know that person, and then it ended up that we got married, Ashley and I. So I credit how I responded in that debate with helping me meet my wife, Ashley. So... So I always think fondly about that. Um, then I was interviewed a year later for the associate pastor position here. And I don't think it was an official question, but I remember some of the folks on the committee asking me what I thought about gay marriage. And I said I would perform one if I was allowed to. And I could tell that they were glad with that response. And certainly a lot, a lot has happened in the world over the last 21 years. Gay marriage has become law of the land. And culture wars have certainly shifted in different ways. Now the frontiers of that, that um, fight seem to be over transgender rights and other important issues. But there's also a lot of give and take and different states are doing things in different ways. When I think back about it, I think that a person's upbringing, especially the example of their parents, their family, and their friends, has a huge influence on how we welcome or do not welcome people across all sorts of diversity. Our faith traditions can have a huge impact as well. And as a cisgender, white, male, heterosexual man, I can't know exactly what it feels like to live as someone who is trans or who is gay or who is not white, but I believe that God created us in diversity for a reason. And I believe that God commands us to welcome people not because of how much they resemble us, but because God creates and loves us all. And we should too. That by welcoming people, and especially people who don't resemble us, we welcome the Spirit of God in our midst. 
as individuals and as a congregation, we can try out and test different ways to potentially expand our solidarity with people across difference. If in the past we have been straight and cisgender and have operated in a place of tolerance, it might be time for us to try moving outside our comfort zones a little bit and trying new ways to be advocates for folks across difference. In life and in Christian ministry in general, there is always more room for us to grow. And my job as senior pastor is to encourage that growth in you as well as in me. I've had the honor here at this church to lead ministries for people of various orientations and backgrounds. I've had pride that we are a voice of affirmation of people across diversity so that homosexuality and different identities don't have to be expressed in underground subcultures but embraced by all people, including faithful people. I am proud of the two same gender couples whose weddings I have officiated over the years and I hope that we can continue to bless same gender and queer marriages in the future. And if anybody ever has questions for me about how I interpret the Bible uh, in ways that are LGBTQIA friendly, please let me know because as a congregational church, it's not that I tell you all what to believe or do, it's that in the inter interplay among us in our community, in the way in which God develops all of our consciences, that is how the Holy Spirit moves. Within our diversity as God's people, we move forward and together. So thanks be to God, and amen. Now let us join our hearts in a spirit of prayer. Oh God, we ask you be with us in this time of prayer, turning to you in ways that only you can answer knowing that you hear each of our prayers. We ask you, O oh God, to bless the youth and the advisors traveling to Maryland today. We ask you to bless their work and their growth. Bless especially Reverend Ashley. Bless the advisors. Bless all those who are apprehensive of what the week might bring. Ground them in your love that serves you by serving neighbors. Bless us all, O oh God, to live out the call to be beloved community, affirming each other across a spectrum of backgrounds and identities. Especially help us to honor those who have been and are still marginalized, including those who are proudly, timidly, or still yet unaware of being lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, or asexual. May those of us who are hetero and cisgender accompany and be accomplices, accomplices in the movement for equal rights and be those who help honor all people at your table. We give thanks for the all-class reunion yesterday at Milford High School. We give thanks for the memories and friendships that were cultivated there and reflected on. We give thanks for your blessing on us as we travel and enjoy the summer. Well, God bless the people in the land of Ukraine in the midst of war. Bless decision makers in Ukraine and Russia and Belarus and beyond. Move us all, O oh God, towards a just peace. We pray especially for Madison today. She prepares to go to basic training. Bless her in her growth and bless her family as the miles beyond them will, will not detract from the love that they share. We pray, O oh God, for those who are ailing in body or in spirit, as we name some now. We pray for Diana and Sharon, for Dave and Larry, for Ruth and Carrie and Benedict, for Matt Mailhot, for David Pavelko, for Anita, for Bill, Oh God, if it's your will, grant them your healing spirit. And we pray for the souls of those who have died and those who are left behind to mourn their passing. We pray for the soul of Jim Birdo, who raised his sons here with his wife, Jean, who cared for Jean through 20 years of Huntington's disease. We pray, oh God, for the five people who died in the Titan submersible. We pray for the hundreds of people who died when the boat capsized off the coast of Greece.
God, offer your hope of Easter to those who mourn. Oh God, remember the Dobbs decision from a year ago with the Supreme Court. We pray for our country not only to honor children, but also mothers weighing very difficult decisions. May we as citizens find a common ground and values to be your people together. God, help us to continue to grow as your children. Help us to continue to follow in the ways of Jesus, whose life is a light to us in the midst of challenge and crisis. Amen. Now may the rainbow of God's hope and the rainbow of God's people be a source of comfort and inspiration and ministry both now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>